Vladimir Ashkenazi at 48 is one of the best pianists in the world. A superb talker on the music he plays, now a conductor, and a man with fierce opinions about Russia, the country which bred and formed him as an artist. In Chris Hunt's South Bankshire film, we see all these aspects of this remarkable man who received international acclaim when he shared first prize with John Ogden at the Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow in 1962. We begin with a look at the pianist conductor in action, rehearsing Beethoven's third piano concerto with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Landmarks was when I first visited the famous Bolshoi Theatre when my mother decided to take me there and introduce me to the great world of opera. Um, I, uh, perhaps that is when, when I saw the symphony orchestra for the first time. That took my whole being and I felt I belonged to this group of people producing these magic sounds. And I remember that throughout the length of that performance, I don't think I looked at the stage, I looked at the pit all the time. completely spellbound. One of the consequences of that was that I went to orchestral concerts like crazy. And I saved all my pocket money for tickets to concert halls. Fortunately enough, I had good friends who were also just as passionately interested in it. So we went together in groups. Uh, usually we tried not to pay for tickets because we had no money really. And we very often managed it by very devious means. We tried to get into the, into the men's room, for instance, like two or three hours before the concert and stay there before the concert. And the men's room was already after the control, so we could be already in the hall. There were many different ways of doing it. This is one of the funniest ones. I suppose I subconsciously realized that this is the ultimate instrument in music, the symphony orchestra. I loved the piano, I still love the piano, but that impression was stronger than anything I remember in my childhood. For the young Ashkenazi, music was an integral part of family life. His father was a pianist who played light music with a Soviet variety show, while his mother was passionately interested in music and ambitious for her son. When Ashkenazi was six, she took him to his first piano teacher, and when he was eight, he entered the Moscow Central Music School, where he was taught for the next ten years by Anida Sumbatian. It was she who inspired in him a love for the piano and encouraged him to seek a career as a concert pianist. As fate would have it, there was this call for an all-union competition as a preliminary to the international Chopin competition. I seemed to be physically kind of just right for Chopin's music. Um, my hands are not terribly big. I didn't, you don't need much bravura in Chopin. You rather need more delicacy and uh, transparency, a certain drama, of course, but uh, you don't need uh, a kind of physical ability to play Liszt or Tchaikovsky concert or something like that. And um, she knew that, and she knew that I 
could succeed if properly prepared. And she prepared me very thoroughly, and in the end, I actually received the second prize. I could have a career as a pianist when I won the Chopin's second prize. Uh, it was simple, practical deduction. I thought that, well, if I'm a second from all over the world, even at that moment, then there must be something in me. Then uh, I must work hard in that case. And that's when I really started working hard, because I realized that this can make my life. Over the years, it's the later works of Chopin that have appealed to the older Ashkenazi. That is the late Chopin's drama. And one can't imagine more eloquent, dramatic presentation than this. And I think that his best works, even if they have passages that one could, if one wanted, call bravura passages, they, they are all full of dramatic meaning in the context of a piece. But I think what happened towards the end of his life that that he discovered more and more potency i think in his mind and soul so to speak than before uh, and found another dimension i think in in in, in his expressiveness um, it is still very intimate but it's very interesting that in going even deeper in, in into his intimate expression um, he ha kind of embraced all humanity in it kind of found a real very strong bridge between him and everybody else whereas I think in the, in his early music it was more just contained to himself and not giving out so much. But that's my feeling. Also, his dramatic impulses became even more sharpened, somehow more focused and more true and real, I think, than in his early music.
After his success in the Chopin competition, Ashkenazi continued studying music at the Moscow Conservatoire. In 1956, aged 18, he won first prize at the prestigious Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians competition in Brussels. Two years later, he took part in a Russian tour of America and was hailed as a great new talent. Then in 1960, Ashkenazi met a young Icelandic pianist, Torin Trygvason, who was one of a group of foreign students also studying at the Conservatoire. They were married a few months later, and this put a strain on Ashkenazi's relations with the Ministry of Culture. We had a lot of trouble before we got married, which, of course, you know, one was getting used to the idea that they tried to kick me out of the conservatory, etc., etc. But um, when we actually did get married finally, there we got a message from the Ministry of Culture. I mean, from a very high-ranking person there. It was not sort of just um, gossip or, or warnings from friends or anything. It was directly from the Ministry, from a high-ranking person, saying that I'd better go and apply for Soviet citizenship immediately. Otherwise, you know, his career would be finished. It's very straight, very <laughs> to the point. So we got married on a Saturday, and on Sunday we went into the country. We spent the day in the country, and you can't go to the office, it was closed anyway. Monday applied. <laughs> a year later, in 1962, Ashkenazi was entered for the second international Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow. The first one, four years earlier, had been won by an American. This time, Ashkenazi, who was the Soviet Union's best hope, was under great pressure to win. I was made to participate in the competition against my will. I was actually officially told in the Ministry of Culture that if I don't participate in the competition, I might as well forget about my career altogether. That would mean no foreign trips and a few concerts in Russia and so on. So, uh, so in the end, I had to participate. Um, I don't like very much Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. I think it's a very decorative piece. It can be made attractive, uh, but you can't uh, put in it uh, the substance it doesn't have. Um, it's a lot of unnecessary bravura in that concert concerto. And I really didn't feel that I was the right person for that. I don't like decorativeness at its best, you know. Uh, well, I had to learn it and play it. competition went to an American, Van Cliburn, and he deserved it entirely. He was so wonderful at that competition. And the, in the second Tchaikovsky competition, the Russians had to have um, Russian win it at all costs, especially because of the official pressure, because of the prestige and everything, and in the Tchaikovsky competition at home and everything, and an American wins it. I mean, imagine that. There was a general disconsolation everywhere in the official circles. So that's why they tried to assemble as strong a team as possible. So they scooped everybody up together. And that's why I, I fell into that scoop, unfortunately. Well, in the end, maybe fortunately, because, uh, um, because of the fact that I won the competition, I... Uh, having married a foreigner at that time, I had a hope of being accepted again as a, a fully-fledged Soviet soloist, so to speak. When you win uh, sport competitions or performing competitions, you enhance your country's prestige. And that's what the Soviet communist system is very interested in, because it presents to the world a very human face, saying, look, what achievements we have. Look what a fantastic country it is. And, I mean, if I take my particular case, if I didn't agree to participate in the Tchaikovsky competition, they would throw me into the rubbish bin and never would even remember about me. 
Uh, and in a system like that, if you're thrown into the rubbish bin, you are really in the rubbish bin for the rest of your life. It's very dangerous. It's like you're dead, practically. Because there is nobody to go and complain to. To complain, there is no legal system on which you can rely on. Uh, there is there is no machinery for you to do anything except in the channels of the system. Uh, well, I don't need to explain much more than that. Uh, also, the net result is that um, these performers who are bred, like uh, keys for foie gras, uh, they become so uniformed. You know, there's uh, so little scope for individuality, for individual expression. These restrictions on his artistic and personal life finally decided Ashkenazi to leave the Soviet Union. Things came to a head in March 1963, when Ashkenazi gave a concert tour in Britain and his wife had difficulties in getting permission to accompany him. Things were just closing in. I mean, I was being reported for wearing a tiny little cross that my grandmother gave me. You know, I'm not particularly religious, and they know that better than anybody. But things like that, you had a feeling that you were being watched and followed and checked on all the time. And in the end, you know, you feel like climbing the walls. I wasn't used to that kind of thing. He was, you know, I mean, the Russians live with this from the, from the beginning. But I, th I thought it was dreadful, and I think I was getting more and more wound up. So when it came, in fact, that about the London trip, I said, look, I would like to go with my husband because my parents live there, and we would like to take our son. First they said, well, we feel that, you know, you should stay at home for this trip. My husband then said, look, you know, let me just cancel it. I cannot go to England where my, you know, parents are law. It's just we can't do it, you know. Let me cancel this. No, 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 you know, you have to go. No way. And so it went on. And the thing is that I have a funny feeling that if they had simply let us go without any bother that time, I don't think we would have, le we would have left. Because it wasn't as bad. But it was building up one on top of the other. People from the ministry coming to our house, we being summoned to the ministry. And things like, in the end, you said, you know, it was like, first thing point, you just had to go. And so when finally they did let me out two days after he left, I mean, and nothing, nothing would have made me go back. I mean, it's just impossible. The Ashkenazis were granted residence permits by the Home Office. The Soviet authorities hoped that they might eventually go back to live in Moscow, but they never did, although Ashkenazi retained Soviet citizenship until 1972. With London as his new base, Ashkenazi was soon giving concerts all over Europe and impressing audiences with his brilliant technique and virtuosity.
Despite his early successes, Ashkenazi felt that, having come from a Russian musical tradition, he didn't have the right repertoire for Western audiences. As he began to expand his range, he initially found difficulties in mastering some of the great European composers. Uh, it's not that we in Russia don't recognize the great, great composers of the West. Of course we do. But because Russian musical culture is so strong, it's so, in a way, all-embracing in the context of that country, um, although it wouldn't have existed without Western music culture, but it became quite separate and quite self-sufficient sufficient on its own. That in a way, um, it, could, it could be without, in a way, Beethoven and Mozart now. It, in a way, it, uh, it um, feeds on its own somehow. It gives, I think, a, a Russian person just about everything he needs from music. So I always felt that I never even began to understand the inner meaning of people like Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and so on. I mean, it's very general plateau. Uh, the impulses for their expression, why they composed like that, what led them to the economy of means where everything has so much more weight, to me looked like uh, it was a a meanness of expression rather than economy of means, you see. So when I detached myself from that and I moved to the West, found an entirely different world in every respect, and found that the ABC of music is actually Beethoven, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, etc., rather than Glinka and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff, however much I love them. Uh, then I started from the beginning of music rather than <laughs> from <laughs> from another part, um, and I um, I spent very difficult time, of course, and I'm still in the midst of a very difficult time. Always will be, I suppose, my character uh, of uh, immersing myself in another world, like becoming a different person altogether. So, coming back to Beethoven, the impact of my trying to immerse in his music is so enormous that I couldn't begin to describe it or to evaluate it. And uh, each time I come back to one of his great works, um, it is, it's again like a new world opening to me. No, when you <laughs> I haven't played this sonata for a few years now. It's, it's hard to express what you feel when you play this. And when I played at the concert, begin this second movement, I don't know, it's like a, a whole world and whole life is, in a way, beginning to open and grow in me, and and somewhere there ended the, at the end of this arch. It's, it's impossible to say it all in words, what you feel with this great music. It has no bottom. Of course, it has no end. It's it's so eternal. Why it is eternal? That is the that is the thing that we we can never put in in, in words. That's why it will over exi always exist. I remember when I started studying Beethoven in depth. I wanted to know everything about him and what he wrote. I even studied his early pieces like piano quartets, which are very unknown in a way. I mean, even in his early sonata, Opus 10, number 3, you know, the famous Largo e Mesto. And so on. I mean, you see, I mean, for a young man to to reach understanding, a sublimation of of something tragic, 
as it is and put it in sound so eloquently. It's a, of course, a miracle. And I moved further on, and uh, of course, I, I, I remember was completely fascinated by the second moment of the third piano concerto, which is in, in the middle of the C minor, which is the Beethoven key. You suddenly come into this repose and and a kind of a depth that again is indescribable. Now, it was better now than the first time. Yeah. Okay, now let's take the big break. The Vladimir Ashkenazi's home is now Lucerne in Switzerland. During the 22 years he's lived in the West, he's vastly expanded his piano repertoire while always remaining a tireless champion of the great Russian composers such as Rachmaninoff.
Russian music is very important to me. I, I was born in Russia. It's, it's in my blood. It's in my system. So it's a kind of part of my self-expression in a way. I think it is basically true that Russians uh, very often express their feelings very spontaneously, uh, uncontrollably very often. It can be a it can be sometimes very positive feelings, kind of feeling of generosity, hospitality. On the other hand, it can be a, um, a cruelty and barbarism, as history shows, as recent history shows in the Soviet Union. I mean, every day shows that. Um, um, well, there is that uh, uh, feeling of spontaneity and generosity in Rachmaninoff which I associate with that particular trait of the Russian character. There's nothing mysterious in it, nothing magic. It's a very uh, ordinary, direct connection. Rachmaninoff at its best uh, offers us a very touching example of uh, spontaneous, direct communication of a positive nature, of, um, of a feeling of sharing his um, enjoyment of life, sharing his um, um, attitude to the wonder of life, in a way, sharing it a bit luxuriously. Uh, but uh, when you can say that Brahms is sharing it luxuriously too, but very few people criticize Brahms for that, and many criticize Rachmaninoff for that. Uh, well, Brahms happens to be a German, and. <laughs> uh, uh, people don't easily criticize German music. Uh, it, it's easier to criticize something that has this funny, funny, magic, mysterious Russian soul. It's not that I'm bitter, I'm just realistic. The trouble is that Rachmaninoff contributed a lot to his reputation of not a first-rate composer by often saying, well, I don't expect anything from it, I write for my pleasure, and I hope people will receive pleasure from that. Recently, I spoke to a, a very highly placed German musician, and uh, um, we talked about this famous desert island uh, concept, you know, what would you take with you to the desert island? We talked about Beethoven, the, uh, the incredible potency of Beethoven music, I mean, the variety and the scale and everything, and Mozart and everything, and we talked also about Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, I don't know, I can't remember exactly. And he said, well, if I went to the desert island, of course I love Beethoven and Mozart, but I would love, rather take Rachmaninoff. <laughs> I don't want all those depths, everlasting, infinite depths. On a desert island, I don't want that anymore. I just want to enjoy myself. <laughs> well, that was, in a way, touching. I know it's only one aspect of Rachmaninoff's music, and I, I, neither did he ever, nor I will ever say that he is on the level with Beethoven or Wagner or Brahms. That's not the point. We should look for something that is idiomatic, substantial and essential to our lives that is expressed in his music. And there is that element. And those who can't find it in that music, I think they are narrow-minded and deaf in a way, and emotionally restricted, and that's a pity.
In recent years, Ashkenaz has been devoting a substantial part of his time to conducting. He began in the early 70s with the Iceland Symphony Orchestra and now frequently appears as guest conductor with major orchestras in America and Europe. The orchestra is the most fantastic musical instrument there is. It has everything you can imagine. It is a complete magic to me. It has always been magic and it, it is magic today just as much, although now I stand in front of it and, so to speak, manipulate this magic. Uh, but it, nevertheless, it's just as magical for me as it has always been. Uh, what happened to me with the passing of time it was that I was becoming more and more discriminating in my evaluation of orchestral performances. Um, whereas when I was a child, when I was a teenager, etc., etc., I was simply enjoying it unconditionally. I could go and hear a fifth-rate orchestra playing a Tchaikovsky symphony and we would be on the seventh cloud, you know. And um, that lasted a long time. Then I started to enjoy only the best orchestras. And then at some point, I suppose, as I was growing myself, and changing myself as a person, I started enjoying only what answered certain uh, requirements inside myself. And I heard less and less of what I thought was true and right. And in my mind, of course, in my opinion, in my understanding what music should be about. Um, not that there weren't such performances, there were, but they were fewer and fewer. And uh, so one of the driving forces then becomes the force that drives you to be there to make the music the way you hear it, the way you want it, the way your requirements are. Middle section. No, no, no. Could you, could you, could you even start so the first note? It's just da da da. It's all, I should be all softer, please. Just all softer. A little more hushed. Say. I think that's the idea. I think it's more to the context here, huh? To the bit frightened. You know, otherwise you. Okay? Is that clear? Kind, thank you. Uh, to me, at this stage, it makes no difference whether I'm communicating through the piano or through an orchestra. Because, you see, uh, I mean, of course, there is a great difference, and at the same time, there is no difference, because it's all music to start with. And all that really matters is the first, your first idea what you want to do with the music. If the idea is valid, then that's already a great basis for it all. Letter T, letter T for Tom. I want it a little more expressive for you. Ta 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 ta. Ta 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 ta. And then you come to the A flat sounding F. Ta 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 ta. And that's even more. It was a bit too sharp, especially A flat, you know? Okay, let's try that. T for Tom. That's good, lovely. That's lovely. It makes more sense, you know, this suddenly into A flat major, E flat major. With an orchestra, you have to conceive and help native people to pursue what you conceived. And they are actually producing, not you. To me, the proposition means a lighter psychological burden on me. Provided, of course, that the group knows you and you know the group and there is a rapport and understanding between the two 
crucial elements. Uh, but well, if there isn't, then I don't think you have any business of conducting this particular group. And if the understanding and rapport is there, then there is very little in the way that you need to do, except to communicate what they already expect you will be communicating. whether I'm now technically in command of an orchestra. Uh, I believe I am, because I get the results, basically the results that I conceive. attempting to com communicate something essential to our lives, something basically positive. Uh, and I hope that, I, I, I think that if it gets to the other end, to the receiver, uh, then I hope it does something good, if it opens somebody's eyes on something important in our lives. That's all I can say. There's nothing more that I could say. It's this general attitude, this general concept of the value of my art. There's a couple of things I would like to mention. I think when we begin the middle section, I think it should be more hushed. It's a little bit too present for my face. A continuación, especiales del 22. Esta noche con el capítulo Maupassant al cine. El padre amable. Inmediatamente después, Estelares del cine. Canal 22. Imaginación en pantalla.